Losing sucks. It really sucks when you lose in the last play of the game. But the best thing that can happen after a tough loss is to get right back on the field and get a big win. Fortunately for Notre Dame, they have the perfect opportunity to get it done on Saturday. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Thursday, September 28th, and thank you for making this your first listen each and every day. My name is Tyler Wojak, and I'm the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018, and I'm a producer covering college football for Fox Sports. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Speaking of gambling, today I'm going to be joined by Tim Murray from VSIN. Tim's great. He's a diehard Notre Dame fan, and he's the host of VSIN's primetime radio show, as well as their college football betting podcast. We talked a lot about Notre Dame's matchup against Duke, what this game means for Marcus Freeman, and then we'll look at Sam Hartman's Heisman odds and if there's still a path to the playoff for the Irish coming off the loss to Ohio State. All right, let's get right into it. Let's talk to Tim. Tim Murray of VSIN is back with me here, and for those of you listening, Tim was in attendance for the Ohio State game, and we actually got to meet up beforehand in the joy slot at the time. Spirits were pretty high. We were feeling good. Not so much now, but Tim, now that you've had some time to recover from the loss, what's your big picture view of this Irish team before they head to Durham to take on the Blue Devils? Yeah, I mean, there's so many, um, you know, things that have been going through my head. My wife today uh, was making fun of me because I I had a big sigh. I was sitting doing some work and uh, she's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I'm just rewatching highlights from, uh, <laughs> from Saturday night. So, uh, you know, it's, it's tough, man. I mean, you know, same end zone 18 years ago. And, you know, I, I, I can't remember if it was you, I think it was you who asked, you know, what was worse, this or the Bush Bush. And I said, and at the time I, I didn't know. And as time has gone on, I, I think it's Ohio state. And I don't think it's a recency bias deal because the more and more I think about it, this wasn't, and not to say that the Bush Bush game was a fluke, but you had a punt return. There were some turnovers, you know, there was none of that, man. This was a clean game, you know, no turnovers by either team, no real penalties, no wackiness. I mean, it was just a, a hard fought game. And, you know, in my opinion, Notre Dame was the better team. Um, you know, Bill Conley's post game win expectancy had Notre Dame at like 60.6%. So it's, it's just tough to swallow. And, you know, obviously, you know, I'm, you've done it on your podcast and, uh, everyone else has done it on theirs and, you know, plenty of people uh, on national podcasts have talked about it, whether it's, you know, the 10 men on the field or it's, you know, the dropped interception or it's the, you know, read option that went wrong or the screen pass or whatever it may be, the missed field goal. I mean, it's tough. It, it's tough. But I mean, I, I think the one thing that I, I take away, you know, from that game, it's, it's, it's a bit of unfortunate, right? You know, it's, it, you're right there against a perceived elite team and uh, you were toe to toe and if not the better team, um, but now uh, looking ahead to Duke and, you know, this was always the really weird part of the schedule, Tyler, for me was at Duke at Louisville. Uh, how is Notre Dame going to respond to these two games? And, you know, I'm cautiously kind of excited uh, for Saturday, um, you know, the more and more I think about it and, you know, I, I think it's a good thing, you know, and I, they learned the lesson last year, uh, DJ Brown talked about it this week and, and shout out to him, man. I mean, you know, devastation for, for, for us fans. Right. But I mean, it, you know, he was on the field, man, he's a six year senior and, and, you know, the screenshot of him in the ball going through his fingertips and, you know, he took all the questions and didn't hide from them and, and spoke to the media. I'm sure he could have told the SID, I don't want to talk to the media, you know, but he did. And that's a leader. And that's why there is some cautious optimism, Tyler, for me, how this team is going to respond on Saturday. And now, look, they could respond and be buttoned up and lose because Duke's good, you know. Um, but I, I do think uh, this team is going to be ready to go. And uh, certainly they learned last year when you're not ready to go, uh, you can lose to some inferior teams. So, uh, you know, we'll see. You know, it's 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 still a tough one to swallow for for me as a fan. And uh, I can I can only imagine, you know, what it is. But, you know, the old adage you've heard, and especially like in baseball or basketball, Tyler, it's, 
let's just get back on the field, man. Let's not dwell on this. And, uh, you know, I had Mike Golick Jr. on my show, V's in primetime tonight. And, uh, you know, he said the same thing that a lot of people have echoed, which is once they put on that tape for Duke, they've got their attention. So hopefully that's the case. Yeah, I'm with you. It reminds me of playing baseball. Like if you make an error in the field, it's so frustrating for that moment. You cannot wait for the yeah. next ball to be hit towards you so you can make a play and get rid of that memory. And the, the last memory of you in the field is making an error. Same with striking out. So I got to imagine the players are ready to go, ready to hit the field on Saturday so that they're able to make up for that loss. And maybe, you know, it's, it's not going to happen all in one weekend. But if they come out and they play a really good game against Duke, that's sort of like the first next step to getting things back on track because there's still a lot to play for this season. But let's talk about that game against Duke. The Irish are favored by five and a half on FanDuel right now. And I'm pretty sure that's where it opened at. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you're like me and that you don't normally bet on Notre Dame games because you're already so emotionally invested in the outcome. But from what you've seen, which side is most of the money on? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it depends on where you look. Um, you know, so Circa, which is a studio, uh, which is a casino, excuse me, where my studio is uh, here in Las Vegas, they kind of set the market. Now there are other spots that put out lines around them, but they put this out to uh, Duke or Notre Dame minus two, and it got quickly bet up right away uh, to, 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 you know, five and a half. And, and it's some spots it's hit six. Um, you know, some of the early betting splits that I've looked at have, have seen, some more Notre Dame money um, and, you know, different people that I've talked to, uh, you know, college football handicapper uh, by the name of Brad Powers that comes on my, my show every Tuesday evening. Um, you know, he said, look, I was looking to bet against Notre Dame, but when the number came out and it was two, I bet numbers, not teams. And, you know, he bet, you know, bet on Notre Dame here. So, yeah, I mean, I think you've seen, and I've talked to a couple different people, um, you know, that I respect their opinion, Tyler, uh, that that are, that are actually looking towards the Irish here. Um, you know, obviously the perceived letdown spot uh, is certainly probably baked in a little bit. Um, and, you know, the question to be asked is, what's this number if Notre Dame won against Ohio State? And I think you're probably looking at around a touchdown. So I do think, you know, the folks that I've talked to, uh, they, you know, outside of Brad, who mentioned he betted at, at two, you know, some of the other people that I really respect and, and have some, uh, you know, pull what's, you know, a little bit in the market. I haven't gotten to the window yet, uh, but that's certainly the way that they're looking. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, I think end of the day, um, you know, probably a little bit more people on Notre Dame, but uh, there will be some Duke money. There's no doubt, you know, considering that they're 4-0, they've won every game by 20 plus points this year. And, you know, in this particular stage against Clemson back on Labor Day weekend, you know, ultimately they won that game by 21 points. They did. And that was a weird game. I yeah, I hope exactly. it's not anything like that on yeah. Saturday. Has the over under moved up at all? Because I think I saw it open around 50 and now it's up to 51 and a half. Um, let me pull it up right now. Yeah. I mean, by the way, just real quickly going back to, you know, thinking back to that Labor Day weekend game. Um, I mean, if Notre Dame does what, Clemson did they're losing I mean and that's something that um you know Duke is very good a, about right uh, they create turnovers and they don't make mistakes uh they're one of the top teams in the country in turnover margin yet again they were plus 16 last year which was second best in the country and uh now they're plus five um you know going to the over under as you uh, asked um this thing opened actually 54 and a half uh got bet down to 50 actually got bet down to 49 and a half and now you've started to see some money come back to the over. So, um, you know, from the opener on Sunday, which was Notre Dame uh, two and a total of 54 and a half, we sit at five and a half with a total of 52 and a half. The peak being six for Notre Dame, and it looks like the peak being uh, 54 and a half from the open. So, yeah, some under money, which is, you know, honestly, Tyler, probably the way I would initially look uh, in this spot. And, you know, I'm actually kicking myself because, you alluded to it, you know, um, I really, really had a feel like a good feel on, on the total uh, against Notre Dame, Ohio State. I, I'm not a big totals better, uh, but I really love the under. And I just, you know, I didn't give it out of my podcast. I didn't break it down on my show. And I'm kicking myself because, I mean, that was obviously a dead under game. And, you know, the, those two defenses are the real deal. They are. And 
I heard that a lot sort of in the lead up to it that people were thinking unders. And then I was like, you know, I don't know. Both offenses can be so explosive. And then after the first quarter, you're like, oh, this is going to be a war between <laughs> those two teams, just like last year. But with the over under being set right around 50 to 52, somewhere in that range, do you think points are going to be hard to come by again in this one? You know, I do. And I'm hoping that Notre Dame's defense continues to build off of what they were. And, you know, you think back to, you know, I, I was very curious and I was sitting next to uh, my brother-in-law um, uh, on Saturday night and uh, he just looks at me and goes, you know, cause he's like, he went to Notre Dame, he knows the game, but he's, you know, got three kids and he's not as crazy about Notre Dame as I am, but he just looks at me and goes, man, number 20 is a star. I'm like, yeah, he is. He's really good. Benjamin Morrison, of course. And, you know, that's something that, you know, talking about it this off season about, you know, the strength of this team and what would it would ultimately be. And, you know, you always, you know, historically Notre Dame's never had elite corners. They've had good corners, you know, Julian Love obviously was, was tremendous. And, you know, going back to the 2002 season with Shane Wooden or whatever, you know, they've, they've had some good yeah, ones, but Vontae stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like they've had some good ones, but like, it always felt like in the biggest moment they were getting torched and, you know, to think back to Saturday night, I mean, look, Notre Dame, even USC ain't bringing the the depth and the eliteness of those wide receivers. So I hope that they're as locked in as they can be on, on Saturday night. And, you know, that's that's the thing here. Right. And, you know, we can get into it. But I, I, you went there, Tyler. I did not. So your your, um, you know, surroundings might be a little bit different than mine. But I, I've heard some people talk about. Uh, you know, oh, they're letting Marcus off the hook and, you know, they're giving him a pass because they like him and all of that. And I'm like, yeah, there's there's some of that. But I tell you what, man, they go out there on Saturday and they lose. It is over, you know, not over and he's getting fired, but the the honeymoon is over. And the honeymoon is has come to a close. I feel like the the plane has landed. You're bored getting off the plane right now for the honeymoon effect with that loss, with the 10 men on the field. But they go back out there and they're ready to go and they're buttoned up and they they beat Duke and and cover and and then they follow that up with another primetime game against Louisville and you're going into the USC game six and one and then you can get that goodwill back up. So I think these next two games for Marcus Freeman, not for job security, but I'm saying for just the feel vibe, the good, you know, what we were feeling, you know, tailgating for that game, what we were feeling with four minutes to go when Notre Dame gets a stop on the jet sweep, those vibes might all be all the way back, but they go on the road. They beat Duke, they beat Louisville. Then you're starting to feel good again. And then you've, here we go again. We got a big boy coming to town and USC probably will be, you know, seventh or eighth in the country and undefeated with the reigning Heisman trophy winner coming in these next two games. I, I just, I feel it, you know, Tyler, these are, these are big, man. These are really big. I totally agree. I said on my Monday recap show that I think this is a career defining stretch for Marcus Freeman, at least at Notre Dame. He's very young. He's going to be coaching for a long time. I'm not going to say that his entire coaching career is going to be defined by the Duke game, but really at Notre Dame, this is an extremely important stretch for all the reasons that you just mentioned. And I was a little surprised by the reaction by Notre Dame fans because I was certainly critical of them. Um, I saw a lot of other people were pretty critical of him. I know Pete Sampson, Matt Fortuna. Matt Fortuna might have been the most critical. Yeah. He sounded like a Notre Dame fan uh, on his podcast, The Independent, and I agree with him. Like, it's just an inexplicable mistake, and I'm sure that it wasn't just Freeman. Al Golden is responsible. Al Washington is responsible, and there was a player. We don't know who it was, and of course, Marcus is not going to just release that kid's name to the media as expected. That's exactly what he should do. I guess shouldn't do, I should say. So it's not all on him, but still, you're the head coach. You got to fall on the sword there and it does come back to you. We'll be right back with Tim Murray, but first a word from our sponsors. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. We got the Lions versus the Packers tonight, and right now the Packers are one-and-a-half-point underdogs at home. 
And look, I love Dan Campbell. I love what he's building in Detroit. But I got to go with a home dog here. Give me the Packers to cover the one and a half. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action than today. The app is easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. As for these next three games, you're right. Duke's a big one. Louisville, another sellout. Actually, the first sellout at Louisville since 2019, the last time that Notre Dame played there. And then (laughs) USC. So what is your perspective on Freeman now coming off the loss to Ohio State? And how do you think he's going to fare over these next three games? Yeah, I mean, it's a question that, um, you know, I've been asked a couple times this week just from friends, you know, hey, what do you think of Marcus Freeman? And uh, a couple of people in the media. And I say, look, man. I want him to work so bad. Um, and Same. It's, it's, I feel like he embodies everything that Notre Dame fans want. Um, he loves the university. I know he went to Ohio State. Um, and who knows what st- stupid chatter would have been out there if they had beaten uh, Ohio State. That's then, true. Uh, At least State that could really be put to bed. <laughs> clamoring to bring him to uh, to b- can bring him back home. Um, you know, I just I think and, and once again, like Tyler, you went there. I've been following this team since birth and. Uh, you know, I just, he, he embodies what you want, right? Someone who embraces everything, who is, is, is out there busting his ass recruiting. Um, and, and just, you know, thinking about, I, I think the post game press conference, I think he was caught off guard. Uh, I thought it was much better uh, falling on the sword as you alluded to in the, you know, midweek press conference, but look it, at the end of the day, it's about W's and, uh, you know, I, I think this is where we we learn a lot about Marcus Freeman. I thought Pete Sampson, you know, pointed out in his article and might have mentioned on his podcast about, look, Brian Kelly had over 200 games under his belt. You know, when he made this mistake, he was at Grand Valley State, you know, as a head coach. You know, you think about other uh, head coaches that have come and gone or at a different, you know, different places, Lou Holtz, you know, they got to do this without – you know, the world watching and uh, he did it, you know, and, and look, I, I'm not going to put it all on Marcus Freeman. Um, you know, it's a big, big mistake. And they, that really is inexcusable, but you know, I, the more I think about it, I mean, I, I think it's a fun, I mean, it's not a fun, it's a terrible <laughs> exercise, but it's like, what was the worst, what was the worst part of the loss? And the, as I went back and I'm thinking like, you know, Audra Gestime goes for 11 yards after you know, and I was kind of in, it wasn't, it wasn't alcohol induced. It was like just a moment induced of like, I don't even remember the DJ Brown moment. Like, it's just like, it, it's all a blur, but like the, the pass on first and 10 to get 12 yards and they fall back in. I think it was Rico Flores. And then they go 11 yards and, and Audra Gestime is doing the feed me. And then you don't give it back to him. And I know it looked like Sam Hartman made a mistake there. And then you look at the screenplay and man, Jadarian Price, if he catches that ball, he's going 30 yards. It was there. The, yep. The blockers are out there and 44 made a hell of a play. He almost picked it off. So it's like, it's so frustrating. And then the DJ Brown, you know, almost pick and, you know, the third and 19 where they didn't bring any pressure. So, you know, there's so many people at fault, um, but the head coach is going to be the biggest to blame. You've got the biggest paycheck. And, uh, you know, you got to got to face the music here. And, you know, that's where I think coming back to it, why Saturday is just just so vital uh, for for them, you know. And I really believe and we can get into the game, you know, certainly as it goes on. But like the offensive line, um, you know, worries me a lot, worried me with a D, worried me a lot going into that game. And man. All credit, man, to them. They played their butt off. I mean, facing – that's an elite defensive front, man. That is elite. And Notre Dame stepped up. So I'm starting to believe, like, okay, this is that offensive line that that we were being promised preseason. And, you know, a lot of us thought that Billy Shrouth would be a starter, and, and he's not, and it's Rocco Spindler, and that's a guy that everyone was asking for, and now they wanted him out. He busted his ass, man. He was awesome. He was great. And uh, I hope that on Saturday, it's kind of an old school kind of Notre Dame win where they just wear them down, you know, wear Duke down up front. Duke's defensive front's fine. Um, It's veteran. They're a very old team. 
Um, but the Notre Dame should be able to wear them down. I mean, Clemson rushed for over 200 yards on uh, on Duke, and they just couldn't finish. So I hope this is kind of like a you know roll up your sleeves type of game, which would lean me a little bit towards the under, where it's like you know what, just go out, do what you're good at, get out of there with a win, and let's go have ourselves a season. Right. If Notre Dame plays their full potential, I don't think it's going to be close. And Duke could play like Duke is a good opponent too. But if you just look at the talent on Notre Dame compared to Duke, Notre Dame is just better at I'm not going to say every position group, but I would say the vast majority of them. And the offensive line, you're right, they looked so good against Ohio State going up against JT Tuo Malau, who might be a top five pick, and he made an unbelievable play. The screen on that play was, screen. yeah, I mean, that was the defining play, man. That was a that was an incredible play, heads up play. Um, you know, if if he I watched it five times today. Uh, just you were I torturing like, yourself today, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he. I'm just like, what happened? Because I look at it, and you've got the three linemen out, Tyler, and yeah. they're just crushing the way. And if Jadarian Price gets that ball, it's 30 yards. He falls down, and 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 we're we're storming the field. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, you got, you, they got elite players and uh, he was getting blocked by Blake Fisher and you could almost like see the gears going in his head. Like, Oh wait, this is a screen. And he drops back and he makes the play. He almost makes the pick, you know? So, um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think hopefully, um, and I know, you know, the uh, on the, on the wake up the echoes podcast, the in-house one where they're certainly more positive about all the things they had, you know, they had Joe Alt and they had a uh, Z Carell up there. And, you know, hopefully this is a builder for them. Like, Hey, you know, nobody, nobody on the schedule, the rest of the way is as good as Ohio state. And I think that's something hopefully they can build off of and say, look at, we played on front on Saturday and don't let up. And, you know, Tyler, I'm trying to remember who said it. I think it was, I think it was Drew Tranquil maybe in, in 2017 when they it lost was. to Georgia. Yeah, and uh, I was I was thinking about that, and I'm like, I hope that mentality is out there. Now, ultimately, they kind of ran out of gas and, and ultimately fell hands of Miami. But, like, remember the post-Georgia game? It was just ass-kicking after ass-kicking. That team just came together and put it on everybody. Now, once again, they ran out of gas, which was – you know, less than ideal down the stretch, but like there was, you know, there was the USC game. There was the NC state game. I mean, there were some big games that they went out and dominated. And, and I hope that this team with the veteran nature of this squad, that's what I'm kind of hoping for Tyler. That's what I'm like envisioning right now. I'm ahead. I'm like, could they do that? Could they do what that team did six years ago after the heartbreak against Georgia and say, I, I forget the quote. I'm going to paraphrase. I think it was like, I am sorry for anyone who's going to play in front of us the next, you know, six, you know, however many games. You were pretty close. I think the exact word he used was, we're going to punish every opponent. That he yeah. literally felt sorry for them. And, you know, there's actually quite a few similarities between that 2017 team and this current one because they had a really good offensive line, loaded running back room, and veterans at linebacker on defense. And that is exactly what this Notre Dame team has. They also have a much better quarterback this year than they did back in 2017. It really does help to have a sixth-year senior uh, in Sam Hartman leading the way because he's seen it all in college football. And going into this Duke game, there's a lot of hype around Riley Leonard, uh, particularly as an NFL draft prospect. And I get it. Uh, He's got the tools and all that. But as a college quarterback, I'm taking Sam Hartman over Riley Leonard 10 times out of 10. So who do you think is going to win that quarterback battle in that game? And how important do you think it'll be to the outcome? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, look, Riley Leonard, um, you know, my, my, my co-host who uh, is a former NFL quarterback, Sean King, he loves Riley Leonard and you know, he's athletic. Yeah. He's a really good player. Yeah. And, and you saw the touchdown run that kind of was the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak against Clemson, right. Where he's kind of went almost, I don't want to say Travion Henderson style, but it was like, are they going to get him? Are they going to push him out of bounds? It was like, oh no, he's going to score a touchdown. It was kind of, you know, it was kind of like that feel uh, in that opener against uh, against Clemson. But um, I, I I want to say Sam Hartman. I don't know, but I, I'll say this: I think that you know the the linebackers 
having the veteran linebackers and, and I, look, I'm not comparing Riley Leonard to Brendan Armstrong. Brendan Armstrong has been very underwhelming this year. Um, but going into that game, you know, it was, Hey, Brendan Armstrong, you know, can, you know, think back to, to 2021 and, you know, what he's able to do in a nice offense. And I think Notre Dame should have a, 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 a fair enough game plan of, all right, don't let Riley Leonard beat us. And I think what helps that is the fact that you have Notre Dame has what seems to be a pretty borderline elite pair of corners that from my understanding are still healthy, right? Cam Hart, you know, has dealt with injuries, but seems healthy right now. And to go up one-on-one, I think that's going to allow Al Golden to be a little more aggressive, whether it's to throw a spy on Riley Leonard or just, just be smart in, in the tactical aspect aspect of that game. So I'm really curious about that because look, Riley Leonard's very good. Um, you know, the Clemson game, he had some, some, you know, really good plays since then, you know, how tested is this team, right? They've, they've taken care of business. They played, you know, Northwestern who shouts to them, got a win coming from 21 down in the fourth quarter against Minnesota last week, UConn, who's been a massive disappointment this year. And then, you know, in, uh, you know, FCS school in Lafayette. So, um, you know, Riley Leonard's really good. To answer your question, I just think Sam Hartman, you know, at some point he's going to throw an interception. I mean, there are some turnover worthy throws that he's had out there and that haven't gotten picked. But I, I think, and maybe this is wishful thinking, Tyler. And I'm, I'm look, I am not usually this homerish, but I, I just think with the veteran nature, why Sam Hartman decided to come to Notre Dame. It was for these games. And, you know, you see his, uh, you know, just just him on the sidelines when that, you know, when the touchdown is scored. And I kind of have this hope and belief that everyone's going to kind of rally together with this team. And this won't be, you know, 2014, where it was just an utter collapse after they lost to Florida State in heartbreaking fashion. That was a really bad time. (laughs) There were also a lot of injuries that played a part in that as well. Like you said, right now, as far as we know, Notre Dame is pretty healthy coming out of that game. And looking at Sam Hartman, his Heisman odds took a hit after the loss, but I don't think he's out of it just yet, which obviously sounds like I'm being a huge homer right now. I think he's got the seventh best odds um, on Fandle, but he's plus 2,200. I'm with you, though. I think he's going to bounce back strong. This is a great opportunity for him, and I think he's starting to realize that these, what, next seven, potentially eight games, maybe more if they make the playoff, like his college career, he's been around forever, but they're winding down, and this is a great opportunity going going up against Duke, a team that he's very familiar with from his time at Wake, and this is a great chance for him specifically to have a huge game because Notre Dame is definitely going to run the ball a lot, but they were actually relatively conservative in the passing game against Ohio State. He didn't even throw for 200 yards. Not really a critique because the running game was working, but I could see him coming into this game and letting it loose a little bit because Duke does have some really good corners, but I still think that they can be exposed, especially if Notre Dame's getting the ball moving on the ground. Yeah, I mean, obviously the injuries at the wide receiver position with Jaden Thomas dealing with uh, his hamstring injury and uh, Deion Colsey out a couple weeks and, and Salerno out. So I, I do love the fact that the, the tight ends are emerging. I mean, we've come a long way from – uh, tight ends, you know, not catching the ball and, Ooh, know. you know, look at this new offense tight ends. You should decommit and come to our school. Cause I know those, uh, those rumors were flying and now, you know, Mitchell Evans re recertain to the lineup and he balls out and, you know, we, we've he seen was unbelievable, man. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's, it's a massive uphill climb now, uh, for him to win the Heisman trophy. This was kind of their moment. Um, and what would have been interesting is if let's say they did salt away the victory, you know, and he finishes with under 200 yards passing, you know, where is he in that Heisman race? It, it you know, because Michael Penix is just putting up ungodly numbers and, you know, Caleb Williams is going to continue to do what he does. And, you know, you know, the, the Michael Penix one is kind of fascinating is, you know, could we get to a point where he may, you know, Washington may lose a couple of times, but his numbers are just so out of this world that, you know, Lamar Jackson style uh, in 2016 that he ultimately, you know, wins this award. But uh, I'm not going to go there just yet. Um, but he's got another opportunity, man. And, and you know, for Sam Hartman, you know, you mentioned the fact that he's played Duke. I think that really helps, you know, as you alluded to. And I think the fact that 
he, I think, if I remember correctly, had his like worst game of his career against Louisville. And that's next week. And, you know, I know Marcus Freeman, <laughs> when he was told the news that Louisville would be another primetime game, didn't look all too pleased, but it is still primetime ABC. You know, that's going to be four straight primetime games on network television. And while it's not ideal from a scheduling standpoint and, you know, rest and all of that and, and preparation, uh, that said, it is a big stage. And I think it does help uh, tr- a little bit of avoid the letdown factor. I'll say this though. There's no letdown factor this week. I really don't believe so. You know, um, you know, the fact that college game day is there, the fact that Duke is number 17 in the country, ABC primetime, Louisville, I, I, Tyler, I said from the jump. Now, I didn't think Duke would be this good. I actually bet their under win total, which is going to be a losing bet. I bet under six and a half because I thought regression would come. Um, I always thought Louisville was the game I circled. Like, can Jeff Brom in that spot, they're going to have, it's one day, but they're going to have an extra day to prepare because Louisville plays on a Friday. Notre Dame obviously playing on a Saturday prime time and it's a travel home and travel to Louisville, obviously, as we know, is not very far, but that Louisville game has always kind of been the one that jumped at me like, yikes, it's a trap. You know, this is going to be the spot. So I didn't think Duke would be number 17 in the country, um, but I do think that certainly raises the antennas for sure for this team. There's there's no way they're overlooking it. And, you know, going back to what I asked Sean King, who, you know, after his playing days, went to the media, Tyler, and then was a coach on USF staff, and they were pretty darn good. I said, what would you guys do? And he said, we would play the tape of the fans rushing the field against Clemson to get their attention. And I think there's probably been a lot of that this week. It's, hey, this team – beat Clemson by 21 points. They're the real deal. Absolutely. And one thing on Louisville, uh, I'm a Louisville native. Uh, one of my roommates, big Louisville fan, actually two of them. Now that I think about it, um, I've watched, I watched the full Georgia tech game. I watched that Indiana game. I actually did not see the Boston college game because we were tailgating all day. Notre Dame should beat Louisville. I know it's Jeff oh, Brown. Totally agree. I know it's Jeff Brom. I know that he has a history of pulling off that upset. But when I watch that team, it's specifically Jack Plummer. And yes, I know he had a great game against Boston College. Notre Dame, if they play well, they will smack them. But again, it's tough when Notre Dame is in this stretch. But I got one last question uh, before I let you go. Right now, Notre Dame is tied for 13th in odds to make the college football playoff. They're plus 900 on FanDuel, and they're tied with LSU, which is a funny coincidence there. And... I, I've seen some people say that they're already eliminated, but personally, I think it's too pre- premature given how close that game was and, can, and considering it's still September. And I don't think that there's one or even two like really dominant teams in college football. So I think there's a lot left to happen. But let's, before we get into all that, let's just focus on this game on Saturday. What do you need to see from the Irish against Duke that would lead you to believe that they have a chance to run the table? Just from the jump, um, kind of embracing the fact that they're the more talented team. Um, you know, I would love to see a, a methodical drive right down, right down their throats, and saying, "Hey, we're we're ready." You know, uh, channeling the Audric Estime feed me type of deal. You know, um, so that that would make me feel. You know, I, I think an early kind of jump on them type of mentality and. Uh, you know, I, I think the improvement of the offensive line, um, you know, and, and just not allowing Duke to get any pressure. Look, Notre Dame fans know Mike Elko is brilliant at, at scheming things up defensively. And uh, Santucci, his D coordinator, is, is his understudy. I think he was a GA at Notre Dame under Elko. I mean, this guy is <laughs> – sorry, Duke fans. He ain't going to be your coach next year. I mean, this guy is that good. I mean, he is he's really, really good. And uh, who knows where he'll be one day, you know, maybe he'll be in South Bend one day. You never know. Um, but I think the fact that, you know, we, we thought, and I thought going into last Saturday, Notre Dame's going to have to figure, going to kind of have to be cute, going to have to out scheme them. Right. Because they don't have the talent. Well, I don't know if they out schemed them, but they, they were toe to toe and, and were the better team. And I think showing the fact that you're the more talented team, embracing that kind of, Georgia Bama style where it's like, we're better than you. We're just going to take it to you. That's where I would kind of get sit up on my seat. Like, yeah, it's on, you know, making Riley Leonard, you know, make some mistakes, you know, 
mean, this is a team that does, like I said, plus five in turnover margin. They don't make mistakes. Make them make mistakes. You know, this is a moment that you're used to, right? Like, yeah, you played on Labor Day night, but this is different. Game day's on your campus. Like, we just had game day. Make them feel nervous in the moment and make you make Notre Dame be like, no, we're the bigger, badder, you know what, and we're going to take it to you here tonight. That would kind of get me geeked up and believe that this team could run the table from here on out. I totally agree. I think we're going to learn a lot in the first half of this game, which is a little bit scary because Notre Dame really tightened up their rotation, specifically on defense in that game against Ohio State. So it's asking a lot for these guys to come back and compete at the highest level just a week later going up against a really good team. But, hey, that's what you got to do if you want to go where Notre Dame wants to go. But, Tim, you know I love having you on. I'm very appreciative of your time, but it's getting late. So I'll let you go. Enjoy the game on Saturday, and uh, let's do it again soon. Yeah, man. All right. Appreciate it, Tyler. That'll do it for this edition of Locked On. Iris, thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. For the everyday listeners, there will not be a mailbag this week. Um, At least that's not the plan right now. I'm planning on having another guest come on the show tomorrow to talk more about the upcoming game against Duke and what's in store for the Irish the rest of the way. So be sure to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast so you don't miss out on that or any other future episode. Also, you can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Irish, on Instagram at Locked On Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler, W O J C I A K. I'll see you guys tomorrow.